الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters, welcome to our adult viewers, a very special welcome to our young and young adult viewers, welcome to the program 30 Lessons from the Life of the Last Prophet Wasallam. welcome to episode number 17, The Prophet Suffers Another Setback, episode 17, The Prophet Suffers Another Setback. Having lost his two staunchest supporters, and with no one to protect him from the forces in Mecca dead set on taking his life and extinguishing the light of Islam, the Prophet ﷺ felt compelled to seek support from people outside of the city of Mecca. In Shawwal of the 10th year of prophethood, the Prophet ﷺ went along with his freed slave and adopted son, Zayd ibn Haritha, to the city of Ba'if to invite its people to Islam. Instead of being greeted with the warm reception and standard hospitality that the Arab custom demands be offered to a guest, the Prophet was greeted with hostility, abusive language, rejection, and ridicule. One of the nobles of Ba'if demeaned the Prophet, saying, Anta Rasulullah, you are the Messenger of Allah? Couldn't Allah find someone better than you with whom to entrust his message? The Prophet ﷺ did not allow these insults to deter him, and he stayed in Ta'if for 10 days, meeting people and calling them to Islam. The chiefs and, no the chiefs and nobles grew so tired of his preaching that in an effort to silence him, they unleashed street thugs and unruly children who pelted him with stones, shouted insults, and chased him from the city. Only after pursuing him for two or three miles outside of the city did they finally leave him be. When they did, the Prophet was tired and exhausted. There were bruises and wounds all over his body. Blood flowed down both of his legs. And Zaid, who had tried to shield the Prophet as they fled, was wounded in the head. At that moment, when nothing seemed to be going his way, and nearly everyone in the world seemed to be against him, the Prophet wasallam, weakened and weary, turned to his Lord and prayed for strength. He said, O oh Allah, unto you do I complain of my weakness, of my helplessness, and of the humiliation I have suffered at the hands of these people. O oh, most merciful of all who show mercy, you are the Lord of the downtrodden and oppressed, and you are my Lord. Into whose hands will you entrust me? Unto some distant stranger who will mistreat me, or unto a bitter enemy whom you have empowered over me? So long as you are not angry or disappointed in me, I will not fret either way. But your pardon is more than enough for me, and is my ardent desire to achieve it. I seek refuge in the light of your face, which illuminates all darknesses, and through which the affairs of the world are set aright, fearing that I should earn your anger, and that your wrath would afflict me. It is your right to chastise me until you are pleased with me. There is no power and no might except with you. After some time, the Prophet and Zayd headed back towards Mecca. On the way, when they reached Qarn and Manazil, they were met by Jibreel and Malakul Jibal, the angel charged with the mountains. Jibreel called out to the Prophet ﷺ, saying, O Muhammad, Allah has sent the angels of the mount I'm sorry, the angel of the mountains, so that if you like, you can order him to bring together the two mountains surrounding Ba'if and crush those people who have done this to you. To which the Prophet replied, No, do not do that. 
I hope that Allah will produce from their descendants people who will worship Allah the Exalted and not associate any partners with Him in their worship. What can we learn from what we heard today? Number one from the lessons, there is virtue in inviting people to Islam regardless of the outcome. When we call people and invite them to the religion of Allah, that act in of itself, irrespective of whether they respond positively, they accept and embrace Islam or not, there is great virtue in simply calling them to Islam, telling them about the truth, and inviting them to join, and ex to join Islam and to accept the truth. So we should always call to Allah and not be concerned about the outcome. Some people will say, why are you going to call that guy? He's not going to listen. Why are you going to tell that person about Islam? They're not going to accept it. That doesn't matter to us. There is virtue in simply calling to Allah and telling people, conveying the message of Allah. Number two from the lessons. Although he was truly the messenger of Allah, the prophet was rejected. So just because we suffer rejection doesn't mean we are wrong. The Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ, he was definitely the Messenger of Allah without question. And even though those people belied him, denied him, and said he wasn't, that didn't change the reality. It didn't make him not the Messenger of Allah. Similarly, some people may reject us. They may mistreat us because we are Muslim or reject the message of Islam. That doesn't make Islam wrong or make us wrong. The Prophet spoke about how some of the Prophets will come on the Day of Resurrection and they'll have no followers. He said in one hadith, when, He said, I saw, I was shown the Prophets and their communities on the Day of Resurrection. And he said there were some Prophets who had no followers whatsoever. They were Prophets. They were aided by Allah with signs and miracles and, um, and books and scriptures and convinc convincing proofs and people still didn't follow them. That didn't make them wrong. The problem wasn't with them. It was with what? The people to whom they were sent and those people, their own sickness and the sickness of their hearts is what caused them to reject the truth. Number three from the lessons is that, and this is related to number two, just because someone cannot see your worth does not mean you have no worth. Just because someone cannot see your worth, they're unable, they're blinded and unable to see your worth does not mean you don't have any worth. Look at the example in the story, how the Prophet came to some of the nobles and chiefs of Ba'if and one of them said, And the Rasulullah, you? You? He belittled the Prophet. He held the Prophet in contempt. He looked down on him. He didn't see how a person, how this person in front of him could be worthy of being the Messenger of Allah. But he was the Messenger of Allah. In the reality, brothers and sisters, is that in life, we're going to encounter people who put us down. People who tell us that we're no good. People that uh, will tell us that there's no good in us. And that should not, we should not let, we should not be convinced by that. We should not let that cause us to doubt ourselves that there is great worth in us. We are good. You are good. And there's great good in you. And you have to believe in that good. If no other good is in you than being Muslim, that's sufficient. And if people can't see the good in you or see your worth, it does not mean you have no worth. Number four, the prophet never quit despite having every reason to quit. It seemed at that point that everything was going against him. He lost his number one supporter in terms of physical support, physical protection, security, Abu Talib. He lost his number one financial supporter, Khadija. He went to Ta'if and he was run out of the city, pelted with stones, humiliated. And the Prophet didn't quit, he kept going. What is he teaching us by his practical example? Not just telling, telling us with his words, but his practical example is telling us, Muslim, never quit, never give up. If you're doing the right thing and you're striving for Allah's pleasure, never give up, never quit, no matter how bad it is. It's not bad enough to justify quitting. Number five from the lessons. We owe the Prophet a tremendous amount of gratitude. Look how much the Prophet sacrificed and suffered so 
so he would benefit? No, so we would benefit, so that we would be guided. If, 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 if you look at what the Prophet went through, if you look at everything the Prophet went through up to this point of the seal that we've studied, look at everything that he suffered. If he quit, could we blame him? Could we? Could I? Could you? Could we blame him? We couldn't blame him if he quit after everything he had gone through. But he didn't quit. He kept pushing and pushing and striving and striving for the sake of Allah and for our benefit so that people like us would come over 1400 years later and be able to be Muslim, be able to accept the truth and be saved from the hellfire and enter paradise. So we owe the Prophet a great debt of gratitude. We have to be thankful to the Prophet for his sacrifice. Because of him, we're able to be Muslim and to have our neck saved from the hellfire. And how can we best show the Prophet our gratitude? By following him, by following his teachings, by not being the people who hear the hadith of Rasulullah and turn away from it. The people who hear the hadith of Rasulullah and say, yeah, mm -hmm, but I think, I feel, if you ask me, well, in my opinion, no, that's not the way you show gratitude to a man who sacrificed and suffered the way the Prophet did so that we could be guided. Number six from the, from the lessons is the importance of turning to Allah in prayer in times of difficulty. Look at the Prophet's example after when he suffered the setback that he suffered in Ta'if. Immediately he raised his hands to the heavens and prayed to Allah. And this is how we should be. We don't do this enough. When things are difficult, we complain to people instead of complaining to Allah. We complain to creation instead of complaining to the Creator. We complain to people who can do nothing instead of complaining to the one who can do everything. Number seven from the lessons is the importance of taking responsibility for our circumstances instead of blaming others. The Prophet ﷺ in reality had done nothing wrong. He had done everything right. But he suffered a setback and it was Allah's will because of a wisdom that is with Allah, that it was right and best for the Prophet to suffer that setback. But when the Prophet prayed to Allah, he didn't complain to Allah and said, why are you doing this? I'm working for you, I'm striving for you. He blamed himself. He said, one of the lines in the, in the, in the dua, he said, so long as you are not angry or disappointed in me, so long as you don't see that I'm not, I'm not working hard enough, I'm not doing the bad. Do, I'm not. I'm. 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 I'm not doing your message justice. As so long as you don't see me like that, O oh Allah, then I'm fine with whatever happens. I'll take it. They can keep dishing it out, and I'll keep taking it. I mean, this is incredible how the Prophet took responsibility even when he didn't do anything wrong. And how many times, brothers and sisters, do we do things wrong, and we won't take responsibility? And so, one of the things the Prophet is teaching us from his practical example, take responsibility, own up, instead of blaming others. And last but not least from the lessons, is we see clearly the mercy of the Prophet wasallam. This amazing mercy which extended to and included his enemies and those who hurt him. The Prophet was even merciful to the, merciful to the people who, under... Normal circumstances, human from human perspective, normal human perspective, we say they didn't deserve mercy. They deserved for him to take revenge on them, but he was merciful towards them. And this is another meaning or another layer of the meaning of when Allah says, We have not sent you except as a mercy to the worlds. A mercy meaning that your presence is a mercy and a blessing for people in ways that they don't even realize. The people of Ta'if were not aware that they could have potentially been crushed between two mountains if the Prophet had what? Had given the order. Mm -hmm. But the Prophet didn't do that. He was a mercy for them, even though they rejected his message. And this just goes to show you again the greatness of Muhammad wasallam, and the great example that he has set for us that we have to try to live up to, to try to match him and be like him that even in situations where we, we can, we are authorized, allowed, permitted, and we are well within our right to take revenge. Instead of taking revenge, we show mercy. And with that, we will close. And, and until we meet again, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all of you. We thank you for being with us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless your houses, to bless your spouses, to bless your families, to bless your rizq, your income to bless the rest of your evening, to bless your iftar, 
to bless your Ramadan and the rest of what remains of this month of Ramadan, to accept your prayer, your fasting, your your dhikr, and all of the good deeds that you were doing and continue to do in this blessed month and to reward you immensely for those deeds. And we ask him to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it and to make us from those who he teaches beneficial knowledge and he benefits us with that knowledge by making us from those who practice the knowledge he has taught us. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa sallam wa barakatuh.